I'm Cynthia Matosian, Preoperative Assessment and Surgical Planning for Successful IOL Pairing. Nowadays, our patients have extremely high expectations of surgical outcomes post cataract surgery, especially patients who are paying out of pocket for an advanced technology implant or a premium procedure have even higher expectations. As a result, it's critically important to successfully match the implant to each eye of the patient. The first thing that I do is I separate the cataract consult from the surgical testing appointment. To me, that's critically important because if you think about it, what happens on the day of the cataract consult? That patient is getting a variety of drops instilled into his or her eye. They're going to have their cornea applinated to obtain an intraocular pressure. They're asked to stare and not blink um, while they are being tested uh, through a variety of uh, pieces of equipment. And so what we want is a pristine cornea and a healthy tear foam. And if you take that patient after all of those tests and dyes and uh, midriatic agents put into the eye and, and start their surgical testing, you're not going to get accurate measurements. And if the measurements aren't accurate, you're not going to get reliable refractive out outcomes. The second reason why I separate these two appointments is to get a less overwhelmed and more educated patient. The patient at the time of the cataract surgery is committing to going ahead with cataract surgery. If you ask them at the same time to also make a decision about the type of implant, they may feel underprepared to do so. To us, it's very important for our patients to become more educated, give them time to check our website, learn about their options, possibly go on the internet, talk to friends and neighbors, and then come back rested, fully informed to better make a decision. And lastly, it really creates a very smooth schedule. I have one column where I'm seeing regular patients, and my second column in my daily schedule is to see preoperative um, patients who are there for their preoperative testing. So this way I toggle back and forth between the two parallel appointments, and this way we have better staff allocation and flow management. What happens during the cataract consult is um, all of these bullets and we're going to go through them one at a time. While the patient is dilating, they watch eye imagination modules explaining to them the basics of what a cataract is, what to uh, expect during cataract surgery. They are exposed to terminology such as FACO, IOL, TORIC, and presbyopia. This allows me to start my conversation with a patient at a much further point along this dialogue to save time and to focus on more important topics than the basics of what a cataract is. I ask patients a very specific questionnaire, which we'll go to shortly. We start treatment of their ocular surface to optimize it for better measurements. We do an OCT, we schedule a variety of appointments for them, and then our surgical coordinator assigns quote unquote homework. And we'll discuss these in detail shortly. The questionnaire is designed to help me better understand what the patient does. I realize you don't see the details in this, it's done for purpose, because you can personalize your own questionnaire. You can decide what questions it is that you want your patients to answer, so you can best customize the type of implant for that patient. And what are some of the things that we want to know? Obviously, occupation and hobbies are critically important. What a hairdresser needs is mid-range vision, for example, compared to, let's say, a limo driver who does airport runs at night where he or she is exposed to oncoming headlights in his or her job. 
So you have to know the hobbies and occupations of the patients in order to better decide which implant makes the most sense. The other thing you want to know is, has this patient ever had LASIK or RK or any other type of corneal or other surgery? Why is this important? Because obviously a post-LASIK patient or a post-RK patient, it needs to have better expectations that their post-operative refractive outcome may not be exactly where you had planned it to be. They need to understand because of their prior corneal surgery, they may require additional procedures. So it's critically important that the expectation be set for the post-LASIK or RK patients. The other thing that you may want to know is how much night driving these patients would like to do once their cataract is done. I'm actually very surprised at how much night driving some of our older patients do, especially during the period when they're heading south to Florida during the winter months. Many drive all through the night to avoid traffic in daytime conditions. Moreover, if a patient is on Flomax or some of the other medications mentioned on this slide, they may have issues with intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. And nowadays, Flomax or some of these other medications are being used in women as, men, as well as men for urinary or bladder issues. So by being prepared, you can then get the ASC to be prepared by having either malugan rings or um, iris hooks so that you can go through your surgical day without any delays or surprises. So under other comments, again, this is still on the questionnaire, what um, types of things may you want to add here? This is where I may put something like possible vitrectomy. If it's a traumatic cataract where you see some phacodenesis or zonular laxity, there is a high probability that this patient may require a vitrectomy at the time of cataract surgery. If this is discussed with a patient, if it's added on the schedule, everybody's better prepared. Moreover, I also added on the consent, so everybody knows it wasn't a surgical complication, rather it was one of the planned procedures from the get-go. So then, at the time of the cataract consult, I assess the ocular surface, and I look at the meibomian glands and the lid margins. We do tear osmolarity testing on every one of our cataract patients. I use lysamine green to stain the surface, and I've been so pleasantly surprised to see how much more I see with lysamine green than I used to with just fluorescein alone. Our patients who are contact lens wearers we advise them to leave their contacts out a minimum of two weeks if they are soft contact lens wearers and up to four weeks or longer if they are RGP wearers or until their keratometry readings stabilize. Tear osmolarity now has become one of the Academy's preferred practi practice patterns. It's a very simple test that our technicians do before any other test is done. It's simple, it doesn't hurt. And when you look at these um, clinical tests mentioned here, osmolarity, Schirmer's, tear breakup time, staining, and tear meniscus height, osmolarity has the highest PPV. And what PPV, PPV stands for is um, positive predictive value. Then, accordingly, I initiate treatment for the patient's ocular surface. If they have a little bit of ocular surface disease, I may just opt for artificial tears, preservative-free, between the time I see them at the cataract consult until they come back for their biometry appointment. The minimum time span is, in my practice, two weeks. And using artificial tears, tears for the patients helps them learn how to squeeze the bottle, how to 
instill drops into their eyes. This way, when they get to their three days prior to cataract surgery date, when they have to actually instill their antibiotic or NSAID drops, they're pros at it and can get these medications in without too many misses. Depending on the level or severity of the ocular surface disease that I find, I may initiate one or some of these other treatment modalities, such as oral omega-3 supplements, cyclosporin, ophthalmic emulsion, azithromycin, or lodopredinol gel or ointment. This is a very interesting um, slide in that you can see of the before and after ocular surface treatment initiation with cyclosporin, there are many irregularities on the surface. And if you had done the measurements on the before slide, you may have gotten um, poor readings on your K's and topography and consequently gotten incorrect refractive outcomes. Once you optimize the surface, look how much healthier that tear film and cornea looks and the results will be much more accurate for you. We also do an OCT to rule out any macular problems. To me, this is critically important because at times it's very hard to see a subtle epiretinal membrane through a pretty cloudy cataract. So if um, you have an abnormality on the OCT, I refer my patients to one of my retina colleagues. The reason I do this, I have found that the patients are so overwhelmed with all the information that I'm discussing with them, they may not remember the details about their maculopathy. But at a different appointment with a retina specialist, they may much better remember that they have a macular issue and consequently realize that their final refractive outcome may be less than 2020. Once I'm done with discussing all of these things with the patients, they go see our surgical coordinator. She answers any of the remaining questions that the patient may have and then schedules the biometry appointment for the patient a minimum of two weeks out with a regimen of QID artificial tears, preservative free of course. Our surgical schedulers also schedule both surgery dates assuming the patient is having both eyes done and we schedule all of the post-operative appointments. We do this ahead of time because we want our patients to keep their post-operative appointments. This way if they have to take time off from work, adjust their schedules, um, work out a driver to bring them to the appointments. They have plenty of weeks to coordinate all of these appointments. As a result, we have very few unkept postoperative appointments. And lastly, our surgical coordinator emails educational modules to our patients regarding cataract surgery and implant options. This way, the patients can watch this video, or a series of videos actually, in the privacy of their home, possibly with their family members, adult children, so that a dialogue can happen about all the options regarding implants and um, additional advanced technology refractive procedures. Two weeks go by, or longer, depending on the severity of the ocular surface disease, and now the patient is here for his or her biometry appointment. So what happens during this appointment? The first thing we do is keratometry. We want that cornea to be untouched by anything else. We have a dedicated manual keratometer that gets calibrated daily and only our most senior ophthalmic assistants or technicians are allowed to do pre-surgical manual K readings. We also use optical biometry, either the Iowa Master or the LensStar to measure, to measure our Ks. Also, I look at Ks using topography. Then, of course, we do um, the axial length measurements with optical biometry. And if there's a discrepancy between eyes or if we're having a hard time getting through a dense PSC cataract, 
our technicians are trained to do immersion axial length measurements. Then I look at topography and I use the NIDAC OPD3 to get my information. So not only do we have to look at the overall K readings, it's also the symmetry and the pattern of the astigmatism. For example, in this patient, if you look at the top row middle map, this patient has a beautiful symmetrical bow tie pattern astigmatism and as a result will be an excellent candidate for a toric IOL. And I would demonstrate this to the patient. We bring these maps up in the exam room on a large monitor and for the first time my patients are seeing quote unquote their astigmatism and now understand the importance or the value that a toric implant may give them. Here's another example of a very um, nicely symmetrical astigmatism pattern. Again, this patient will do very well with a toric IOL. In contrast to this map, this patient was referred to me by an ophthalmologist in our area, and this woman had had um, and toric implant placed in her eye. And I'm sure looking at this map, you can tell she really does not truly have a symmetrical bow tie pattern. And moreover, she's a soft contact lens wearer. And this pattern was because she was asked to remove her contact lenses minutes before this test was done. So this is a pseudo astigmatism pattern, not really symmetrical but this ophthalmologist didn't recognize it and went ahead and placed an intraocular toric implant in this eye. And unfortunately, I had to explant the toric implant, put in a monofocal IOL, and the patient has done very well and she's very happy. I also review angle kappa in all of my patients. Let's look at that. If you look at the middle map again, you see where the red and the blue lines cross together, and it is a little bit decentered than the anatomical center of the pupil. So angle kappa is the difference between the anatomical center of the pupil and the patient's visual center. So I engage my patients in this discussion, and I'll actually ask them, do you see where the red and blue lines meet? And they say yes, and I'll say, do you see that it's a little bit off-center? And they always say yes. So consequently, I tell them they are not a candidate for a multifocal implant, because anything over or larger than 0.44 in an angle kappa in my mind excludes a multifocal implant because then they may be looking through some of the rings in the center of the multifocal implant. And this is another view of how decentered this patient's um, visual center is compared to the anatomical center and the angle kappa measurements are actually located in the lower right hand corner and in this patient you can see in the photopic and mesopic uh, pupil sizes both numbers are significantly larger than 0 0.4. Then I show my patients their dry eye as the saying goes, a picture says a thousand words. So when they see wobbly, irregular, um, kind of uh, um, wavy, placido disc images, I tell them this is their ocular surface. It's dry, it's unhealthy, and this is a pre-existing condition and that this may or will get worse as we get older. So I kind of reinforce to them that cataract surgery does not quote unquote give them dry eye, that it is a pre-existing condition and cataract surgery has nothing to do with it. Also by showing them their irregular placido images, some of my patients have become more adherent to their regimen um, or their treatments for their ocular surface disease. And when they come back and we re-photograph them and show them their improved, smoother placido disc images, they now understand that their treatment is working, so they really stick to it. This is Bill Trattler's um, image. 
And this is a very, very interesting one, so I'm going to go through it, and there's a um, sister slide coming up shortly. This is the ocular surface of a patient. He was referred in a consideration of a presbyopia correcting IOL. Based on the K measurements of this patient, um, a technus multifocal plus 20 was chosen. But fortunately, they decided to treat the ocular surface first, bring the patient back, and remeasure. And now the cornea looks very different. The Ks change so dramatically that there's an entire one diopter power change in the IOL choice. Had the surface not been optimized, this patient, as you saw in the previous slide, would have ended up with a plus 20 diopter technus multifocal, whereas they really needed a plus 21. And we all know in a multifocal patient, a one diopter difference would have meant or resulted in a most unhappy patient. So now comes the final kind of moment where you as the surgeon have to keep all of these points into, um, take all of these points into consideration to recommend the proper or customized implant for that patient. You have to analyze the patient's entire ocular situation, including their hobbies and driving preferences. You have to review the patient's lifestyle questionnaire to see what's important to the patient. How important is it or how motivated is the patient to be less spectacle dependent and at what distance? You need to take into consideration the ocular history of the patient. Do they have amblyopia? Do they have prisms in their glasses? You have to assess and treat the ocular surface. You have to review not only the amount of astigmatism, but the pattern of the astigmatism. Moreover, you have to take into consideration the OPD3 data, such as the angle kappa, and of course, make sure there's no posterior pole pathology by doing an OCT. Based on all of those factors, I always offer every patient two choices. I find that offering them more than two can become very, very confusing. I always offer them the standard implant and let them know this is at no additional charge. It comes with their insurance package, but they'll have to wear glasses full time. And then my second choice is always an advanced technology choice, including out-of-pocket expenses, whether it's an advanced technology implant or additional services such as LRIs, blended vision with mini-mono, and so forth. And of course, we have to advise the risks and benefits of the different IOL options we're recommending. In order to get the best surgical outcomes, you need to personalize your A constants, you need to personalize your surgically induced astigmatism, and you need to use proper IOL formulas. So if you do all of these and offer the patient two options, they're not overwhelmed, they are now educated, they come back, they know their options, and they are very easily able to choose between the standard and the upgrade model. And these patients become very happy. They become your ambassadors of goodwill, sharing their positive outcomes with their many friends, neighbors, family members on social media. Thank you very much.